after coffee break, we will continue with the next installment of the Sobham Seifadini uh, lectures on algebraic on the algebraic structure of groups of area preserving homeomorphs. Okay. Thanks. So uh, again, today, uh, as like last time, we won't see any homeomorphism. Right? We will continue with the crash course on floor. Uh, so let me. I think one thing I should have done last time, which I forgot, was just to say actually what was the original motivation of floor for defining the, this floor homology. Well. It was motivated by uh, by an Arnold conjecture. I think this is from the 1960s, actually. So in the 1960s, actually, Arnold formulated a number of really fascinating conjectures that were you know, surprisingly strong for the times. Uh, and one of them is uh, is his conjecture on the number of fixed points of Hamiltonian if you want. So he conjectured that if you take a non-degenerate Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Then the number of fixed points is bounded from the load by some quantity that depends only on the topology of the manifold, and the quantity is the sum of the ranks of the uh, homology group of the manifold, so the sum of the Betty numbers of the manifold. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, so th this is this. What you should keep in mind: this was kind of a surprising conjecture for the time extremely bold because what was known at the time, so we could examine it on, a, on an example. So take M to be the torus, a symplectic torus of whatever dimension. And now phi being Hamiltonian, it's isotopic to the identity. So there is a famous fixed point theorem that tells you, gives you a lower bound on the number of fixed points. It's the first fixed point theorem you learn about in the course in algebraic topology. It's the left shift fixed point theorem. So left sheds tells us that since phi is isotopic to the identity, the number of fixed points of phi is greater or equal to the Euler characteristic of the manifold, which is zero. So left sheds gives you zero. This was kind of the state of the art as far as I know in the time when Arnold posed and, and uh, there is good reason it does it because Lefschetz is not a symplectic. It just applies to anything that's isotopic to identity. And now, if you take the torus, you see that, for example, you could take rotation in one of the coordinates, and this has no fit. And even symplectic. Right? But there's no contradiction because Arnold says Hamiltonian. <laughs> there is no there is no Hamiltonian that generates this. Is this clear? This is this is an enlightening example. So you see that it's really a statement about maps being Hamiltonian diffeomorphic. And now look at what Arnold says. So Arnold says for a generic Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, number of fixed points is larger than, than the sum of the Betty numbers. Think for the torus of dimension 2n, 2 to the n. That's much bigger than that. It's, it's a lot of it. You wouldn't expect this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, we'll see that four proofs. Okay. Okay. So, so that that's the motivation, and it's a, it's a really good thing to keep in mind. Uh, okay, now we go back to the setup for floor model. Are there any questions about the motivation? Now we get a little more technical. So recall, I have a symplectic manifold, uh, and then I assume phi two is zero, or it, it was sufficient actually to assume omega, the symplectic form, vanishes on phi two. All we need is that if you have a sphere in the manifold, then it's symplectic. Once you integrate symplectic form on it, you get it. Now, we are going to do more somology. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. If you take H, so that's good. If you take uh, phi to be, so I'll write it here, 
That's a great question. So remember, you have a Hamiltonian H, uh, time dependent, it depends on a time variable. And then this gives rise to a flow. And what you're doing is you're counting one periodic orbit to this or six points of time on it. Here's the intuition I know. I mean, drop the dependence on time. So suppose it doesn't depend on Okay. Then note, F, so then note every critical point of H is, uh, is equal to a zero of the vector field I say. So the critical points of the Hamiltonian give you fixed points of the, actually the entire flow hence of the time one. How many critical points does the Hamilton the function, a non-degenerate function have on a manifold? Well, more homology tells you that it's bounded on this. So, yeah, maybe it was a, an extremely optimistic uh, uh, conjecture. Well, with the motivation I gave, it seems extremely optimistic. Maybe Arnold had other motivation. Yeah, but I think Arnold did not know that. That was proven by Weinstein, like 10, yeah, yeah. 15 years ago. But Weinstein proved that the conjecture was closed in the C1 neighborhood uh, 10 or 15 years ago. There is another, actually not another motivation. The, if you take the, the Poincaré-Birkhoff theorem that says that if you take a twist map of the annulus, it says it has two fixed more than what the mission expects. Now, if you take a twist map of the annulus uh, and glue the annulus together, you get a map on the, on the torus. And it tells you that it should have four fixed points and three fixed points. Uh, so it, this is given up as, a, as a, another motivation. So you see, I mean, here you see the connection to more homology. Okay, so now we're going to do more homology on this loop space. So it's the set of the loop space is an infinite dimensional manifold, and it's the set of maps from the circle to the manifold, uh, uh, which are contract, contract, so it's a trivial, homotopically trivial loops in the map, okay? And now you begin with your Hamiltonian again. Uh, I assume it's non-degenerate, which means just that the, the, the fixed points of time one map are non-degenerate. One is not an eigenvalue uh, of the derivative of the fixed points. And now I associate to this the action function which takes a loop X and is give the signs to it this quad. You integrate the Hamiltonian over the, over the loop and subtract from that symplectic area of a choice of a contraction. Uh, and since it's the disk, uh, I mean, it doesn't depend on the choice of U because like you. And uh, why, are, why are we looking at that? If you wanna solve your node conjecture, well, the reason is that there is a variational principle that goes back a long time. It was certainly known at the time of Floor and uh, Arnold, I think, as well, is that the critical points of this action functional are uh, precisely contractible loops, which are one periodic orbit of the set. So X is a one periodic orbit. Of the ice. We need I just want to spell this out and then the set of maps will look like this. And you you have x at zero, let's call that the point P, and then x at T has to be by to flow along the ice cook before time. And this has to be contracted. So in particular, note that this embeds, injects into the fixed point. You just take one periodic orbit and send it to the point. Okay, so if you show there is a lot of these, as many as predicted by Arnold, and you're done with your node. And that, that's what uh, floor. So uh, a note that I should have pointed out last time 
a priori, this set is empty. We know after the fact that it's not, but you know when you start to set up the whole theory, we could be doing uh, various manip manipulations on the empty set. Okay, so now the floor complex. Uh, so the you know, the vector space chain complex is defined in this way. There's so call it CF the floor chain, the floor chain complex of H. It depends on other choices. Like remember, in more cinology, you need function and the Riemannian metric. There's going to be a Riemannian metric on the loop space, which I'll kind of tie in the background when it comes back. We might talk about it later if it's time. So the floor complex of H is just by definition the span. And a span over Z2 of the critical points of the action. And there is an index here too, just I just mentioned there's an index, but I won't talk about it. So then you take critical points uh, with index of X equals to K. This is called Conley Zender, CZ. Uh, and I won't give you that So, not too complicated, but it's kind of a large story. It plays the, in, in some ways, it plays the role of the Morse index. And now there's a differential of the complex, just like in Morse small. So you have a boundary map that takes CF K of H. And it sends it to CFK minus one of H. And it has, I mean, it's a linear map, so it has to have the following page. You just have to define it on the generator. So I take a generator uh, in basis of my vector space. So I take a critical point on periodic orbit X, and it, it, it's naturally going to have this form. You count certain objects, which I'll define in a second, in the case of this. Overall, y and y has to be critical point with index is one less than one. Now I'll tell you what you count. That's the hard, hard part, most of the part. I think I'll push it most of the So, what is this m hat of x1? So, first I'll tell you what m of x1 is. You remember. From Morse homology, we were counting gradient flow lines of the, the Morse function. You're going to do the same thing. So M of X, Y is going to be maps from the real line into the space in which you're doing Morse homology to the loop space of that. That satisfies the gradient flow equation. So U dot at S equals minus gradient of the action function of I'll put it in quotes because as an ODE, this is not really well defined, but I won't go much into it. But let's see what this should look like, okay? So, um, all right, uh, and, and it's it, they're supposed to go from X to Y. So u at minus infinity should be x, and u at positive infinity should be y. So it means that you're looking at objects that look like uh, u is a, is a path in the loop space that starts at x. So x is the loop here, a one periodic orbit of our Hamiltonian flow, and it ends at y. So y is another loop. And so it's a path of loop that starts at x and ends at y. So it's the cylinder that looks like this. That's what you would like. Uh, and then you will have to satisfy this, this equation. <laughs> now, uh, I could 
I prepared a derivation of the equation, but uh, since time is short and we don't really need it, I'll, I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. But there is uh, there's a derivation of the equation. It's the four equation I put on before last time. It depends on the choice of the almost complex structure. And it's also, there is a PDE that we have to solve. So DS is U, it's, it, 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 it can be, if the solutions are given by PDE that looks like this. And this is called Flores equation. And the idea is to count solutions. To this. Now, I won't say much more about it unless there's time. So the point is that there is a PDE that you could write down. Uh, the J is something that defines the Riemannian metric on our loop space. And you count the solution to this. And this PD, I'm sorry, the index of the PD in the theory common generator. Now, here's the point. Uh, it's kind of a long story. I don't want to do this, but maybe I'll say the following. Now, in most models, you can look at the index, the um, the, the dimension of the unstable is the following state. Here, the unstable manifold is infinite. The stable manifold is infinite. This is one of the difficult, principal difficult things. Uh, this index, therefore, is not the dimension of the unstable manifold. However, one of the insights of plural is that if you change two fix an x and fix a y, then the dimension of the space of curves that goes from the index difference you can make sense of. And it's a finite dimensional uh, in difference. It's, it's a finite number that somehow can be associated to the common okay. So that's that's really a key observation of four. Index does not make sense, but index difference makes sense. Then we will have to solve this PDE. This is an elliptic PDE and it's a, it's a Fred Ohm operator. You have to point to zeros of a Fred Ohm operator. The Fred Ohm index of the operator turns out to be the difference in index between the Collins and index at the top and bottom. I mean, this is like, this was the key observation from Florida, like just push the whole theory. So instead of doing like, you know, solving ODE, you're now gonna solve the PDE and the analysis is quite deep. So it's done by Thor and Holfer and Solomon. Yeah. Ah, okay. So if H is autonomous, if H is autonomous, H uh, equals H, they're also autonomous. Then uh, uh, what happens is that DS at U plus uh, now J at U, now BT of U will become zero. So then you have minus, so it becomes minus X H. Okay. This is the Hamiltonian guess. And now J has this property that when you multiply it by XH, it gives you gradient uh, or minus gradient. So this is then you're writing, so this becomes equivalent to DS at U plus uh, uh, gradient of H at U equal. So, so the consequence is that if you plug in a gradient fall line, it is a solution. But there is a subtle, there could be solutions that look like this. I mean, so then there's a point, there's a point, there's gradient flow lines, but there could be also, remember the found solutions in the path state. So there could be things that look like this one. But in this way, you see that it's really a generalization of more homology. Okay, I mean, we had a discussion that was kind of, kind of longish at this point. I'm happy to answer the questions, but for those of you who are trying to follow the big picture, uh, kind of forget about everything I said after this point. If it was confusing, just focus on the fact that there is you're, you're counting gradient here. Okay? That's what that's what you're going to do. And floor says it can be done. Uh, I'll, I'll put a theorem on board saying that this can. Any other questions? While I erase the board. You're going to see that things work out exactly as in the case of Mark Mark. That's the, that's the miracle of the whole story. So, back.
Okay. So now M of X, Y, so the space of gradient trajectories from X to Y, uh, here are some facts about it. It's a finite, it's a manifold, finite dimensional manifold. Uh, uh, and the dimension is of dimension index x minus index x. And so secondly, so, so this is, there's a lot of people now. We'll just say it's, it's a non-trivial state. It's far more complicated than the case of Morse mode. Now we could define m hat of x, y. Uh, and let me recall the gradient trajectory. If you have a gradient trajectory, you could always shift it in the r direction. And it still remains a gradient trajectory. So there's an action of r. And the Morse homology was there, pure too. So then you define m hat of x, y to be m of x, y divided by this action. So then you're counting. Uh, you're counting on parametrized gradient trajectory. So if the difference in index is one, then if in the case you're interested, if index of x minus index of y equals one, then m hat of x y is uh, of dimension is compact that's t of dimension. I mean, a priori it could be non compact of, uh, of dimension zero, so hence five. Keep in mind we are counting we are counting objects in an infinite dimensional manifold. There's no there's no compactness here, so it could be just being zero dimensional. It could be, but there's a compactness theorem. It's called the Gromov floor compactness theorem that tells you that the that this is a compact set. So that's also kind of a typical condition. Okay, so since it's finite, then hence finite, and therefore this count makes sense. So the, 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 the operator, the, the boundary operator, this D, makes sense. Okay. Question? Okay, we want to, yes. Uh, all right. Well, I, I guess so. Simple. I think. Yeah. But maybe it's uh you no. Know, I mean uh, it's it just I'm used to saying on camera, but like, maybe if you prefer to think of it that way, I think that that seems to be right. right. But, but the, the point is that to keep in mind that I'm saying this is actually, I said compact of dimension zero, but it's actually compact of dimension index x minus index y. If the difference in index is uh, six. Well, but in that case, there being, I, I think what you say is correct. Now, uh, okay, so we have a homology theory for it to make sense. First, you need the, the, the boundary operator to be well defined, which we did, but it has to square to zero. So another fact is that d squared is zero too. Uh, and this is also again a consequence of consequence of this compactness theorem. And, and the reasoning is similar to before. You have x uh, and you have y, and you when the boundary operator counts objects that look like broken. So they look like cylinders that break at a third curve V. Uh, and in this way, uh, and there is just as in more homology, you could see these as a boundary of a one dimensional compact manifold. So there, you could smooth them out and you know, create curves that go from here to here. Uh, and, and then this eventually breaks at another, another configuration of this side. Therefore, the number of the, the 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 number of objects that the boundary operator counts, d squared counts, is the number of boundary points of a one manifold. That's always 
Okay. And now, okay, so, so we have a well-defined, any questions? So we have a well-defined homology. But, but as I said, initially, the set of critical points could be empty. So, so if that's empty, then the whole thing is zero and we've proven nothing. So there's another theorem. So there's another theorem again that says, actually, uh, it's not empty. Uh, the, the theory is not zero. So there exists a map. There exists an isomorphism. Uh, B from uh, the singular homology of the manifold. Well, in fact, this is K of M to the floor homology of any choice of that panel form. Okay, so the floor is here. And all the stuff I told you so far is, uh, I mean, the, the key ideas were initiated by Thor. And then uh, I, I think as far as, I mean, it, and then it becomes more and more general. There's lots of names I could associate with, but at least in the setting of 530, Hofer and Solomon had really important contribution too. Uh, and there is, all of this was based on the famous paper of Carney and Zimmer as well. Might be getting the name wrong. But four has to be that point for sure. That's obvious from negative. Okay, so then we as a corollary to get the Arnold conjecture. Corollary, Arnold conjecture. Right? Because it tells you the rank, the sum of the ranks of the floor homology groups, which are generated by one periodic orbits, is the same as the sum of ranks of the the, the, the sum of the Betty numbers. In particular, there is one periodic one. Uh, so, before defining the homology, but I believe we actually defined it in a slightly different setting than here. Uh, and then, uh, both of Solomon, I do not remember what except. I mean, uh, this is reported. So, okay, but every, I think it's no yeah. time. Floor's paper had, uh, I mean, there were some issues in the paper. The, the general idea was correct, but the, some of the analysis got to the way put again, so they were corrected. But I think, I believe Floor actually did it, in, did not do it in the pi 2 equals zero setting. They did it in a slightly different setting, and then Floor, Hofer, and Salomon did it in that setting. But then, you know, you, you want to remove the assumption. If the conjecture was for any man. And so you want to remove the assumption that pi two is zero, omega vanishes from pi two, and so on. So that's why I'm not exactly sure in the history because it gets as you make the manifold more and more general, the technical aspects of the theory, like the parts where you need to show n is a finite dimensional manifold, starts to break apart and it becomes extremely hard. And it was just settled like finally, I think at this point people accept it, and it was just settled very, very recently in work of art. I mean, there, there are lots of others. I mean, for example, I think I should add Fukaya, uh, Fukaya Ono, or Yu Tian, or A lot of the analysis in the initial phases of why this is actually a smooth manifold and so on was put on a sound, a sound footing by both of Okay, so I think I'm um, kind of done with Hamiltonian flow. But we actually need another version called Lagrangian. It's quite similar, but there's like a, any questions? Well, I don't actually have to give it to proof of my term, as long as. Uh, we'll get an understanding of some aspects of form on the Okay. 
So if, if there's come out, if there's interest at the end of the talk, I tell you how I would get some requests. So now we are done with Hamiltonian floor homology, and we do another version of floor homology, which is called Lagrangian floor homology. This was also introduced by Floyd, who said all another. So let's recall what a Lagrangian is. So uh, you take a submanifold L inside M omega. This is of dimension 2n. This has to be half dimensional. It is, you say it is Lagrangian of mag if omega vanishes out. Know, somebody, yeah. It's a symplectic form, but you restrict it to the standard space. Here you get it. And the examples that are actually important for us are curves in surface. Uh, the curve gamma in the surface in a symplectic form. Non attractable curve, but it could also be. And then what's going to be important for us later is products. If you take the product of Lagrangian and the product of symplectic manifold, then you get Lagrangian. So, another example of product. And maybe another example that's extremely important historically and from the point of view of Melatonin dynamics is the zero section in the Copernicus. The Lagrangian is the symplectic form of PQ, and P is just a manifold zero along the And now, So we're going to do floor homology for Lagrangian. So here is the setup again. We'll see it's very similar to the previous case, floor homology. So now I'm going to assume the assumption that pi 2 at 0 needs to be replaced with pi 2 of n L. Uh, meaning, uh, what does this mean? Uh, it means that if you have a disk, so if you have a disk into the manifold such that the uh, boundary of the disk lands inside the Lagrangian, then its symplectic area is here. Uh, an example is uh, the non contractible curve on the surface. Uh, it, it, it moved like this on the surface, but there's just no disk bound. And now here is again a sort of a loop space. We have a path space. Now what we want to count is yes. Yes. Uh, yes, you're you're right. Uh, yes. So for floor homology fixed, so I have a fixed L inside the and omega, I fix a Lagrangian submanifold text. You fix a Lagrangian submanifold with this property. That if you take a disk in the manifold whose boundary is on the Lagrangian, then you want the area of that disk to be. It, it plays the same role as actually maybe I should state the Arnold conjecture. Give you the motivation. So there's an Arnold conjecture that says. It was stated for the cotangent bundle. So the cotangent bundle, uh, 
has this property. Any, uh, yeah, the cotangent one will have this property. The zero section in the cotangent one will have this property. And our node conjecture here says the number of intersection points between pi of L and L is greater than or equal to the sum of the many numbers of the line. And here you need again a non degeneracy assumption. Uh, it's if phi of L intersects L transfer. <laughs> phi is a Hamiltonian that you will take. Thank you. So you take a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, you apply it to a Lagrangian. Uh, generically, the intersection of the image with the Lagrangian is transverse. So this is an n dimensional submanifold, n dimensional, the two n dimensional submanifold. So generically, this is a finite count. You count, you're supposed to get something that's at least as big as the sum of the very numbers of the Lagrange. Again, the example in the torus is quite enlightening here. So if you take a curve on a torus, if you take this, this curve on a torus, you see that with a symplectic isotope, you could just shift it off itself. You could push it off itself. And so it's not true for symplectic again. area preserving. But if you take an area preserving diffeomorphism, which is Hamiltonian, then it has to have two intersections. Mention two, you need to verify. You don't need four or more of these in the mention. Another example is like the sphere. Oh, that, no, that, no, that one I should talk about. Okay. So again, it's a statement about Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms and the way they interact with the Lagrangian sub. Uh, and again, it's a, it was a bold conjecture because it, it's too many intersections. As you can see, if, as soon as you move off the Hamiltonian category, the number drops to zero. And the inter, the, I mean, L could be the zero section of a cotangent funnel, and that's where he formulated that thing in the first place. Yeah. Um, there is a similar intuition. If, uh, if L equals zero section, and M is equal to P star of L, so the zero section in a cotangent bundle. And then now you take the Hamiltonian, uh, which goes from, you take a Hamiltonian from L to the real line, and then you lift it. So uh, uh, pi H composed with pi, this is a Hamiltonian from P star L to the real line. Then you see that the critical points of the Hamiltonian uh, all uh, 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 zeros of the vector field, uh, and so it stays the same. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, yes, but the fiber is somehow is not a compact manifold, it's contractible. But the theorem says, uh, you'll see, it, it implies there is one intersection point, but, uh, but it's kind of obvious because you're. You know, by is actually the compactness of all the things, so you have to cut this off away from the zero section. So in that case, it doesn't pay. Yeah, that's why I don't have anything. Okay, so this was the model. And uh, now you're going to define a floor homology that basically counts the intersection. Here I'll go maybe uh, so we are so okay so I'm back up there. What do I have? I have a Lagrangian inside the symplectic manifold with the property that the uh, area of a disk is bounded in the Lagrangian itself. And now I want to do uh, floor. Homology. 
So first, I need uh, something that is going to replace the loop space. This is going to be the path. So a path that begin and end on the LeBron. So it's maps now from the interval into M, such that X at zero is in the Lagrangian and X at one is also in the Lagrangian. And then there's this uh, extra condition that uh, if X is a homology, the homotopy path of X is zero in I1 and in or draw a picture. Uh, meaning you're counting objects that look, it, it is, you're looking at objects that look like this. This is L, M is out here, and you're looking at paths that begin and end on the Lagrangian. Things that look like this. And then I want this contractibility condition that was there before. It means that I can deform these paths into the Lagrange. So they bound this, yes, they bound it. Deform them into the Lagrange. So they're trivial in I1, the relative time. And now you take again H, Hamiltonian. Uh, Uh, and it has to be non degenerate now in the sense that phi uh, 1 h of L, phi uh, 1 h of L intersects L transpose. If there are, uh, I mean, in particular, the empty intersection is also trapped. Uh, and now you define the action functional again. This time it depends on the choice. I won't put the L in the notation, but obviously it depends on it can be defined here. So it's a map from this path space to the real line. Uh, what does it do? You take the path X and you do more or less the same thing as you did before. So you integrate it, uh, you integrate. At H T, integrate the Hamiltonian on the path. Uh, then you subtract from this the area of G. And U is exactly capping this. This is, and then this is well defined for the same reasons as before. So a priori, this depends on the choice of this. U, but uh, well defined because I'm assuming pi two is zero. Relative pi two is zero. Okay, so we're going to do uh, uh, more homology for this uh, for this uh, functional. You could probably guess what the. I mean, just an analogy to the Hamiltonian setting. You will. You could probably guess what the critical points are. There, there are paths that are tangent to the Hamiltonian vector, what we call ports. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I pick not every curve has this property. Uh, sorry, not every path has this property. I pick paths that start on the Lagrangian and the Lagrangian for which I can find the distance. I mean, it, it, this is a condition that's saying that in this relative homotopy group or, it, yeah, it is this condition. But not every path has that property. Like uh, if you, exactly, if you start uh, with something on that yellow circle that goes around, that doesn't count. But if you go on something that just goes off and comes back and then, these are the sort of objects we want to make, the sort of paths we want to make. So what are the critical points? The critical points of AH is again, a computation. It shows it's set up paths, set up points in our path space, such that, uh, how do I want to write this? Uh, X of T is equal to phi T H. 
apply to the text itself. So it's something that's tangent to the Hamiltonian thing. Uh, so meaning, I mean, the picture is this. So if this is L, and you start off with uh, this right, So you, I mean, your path was something like this. This is X at zero, say, uh, and so if I call it T, uh, and I find T, X at T is just this way. So it's a path that's tangent to that one. Okay. And clearly, these things embed into the set of intersection points of L with itself. You send it to time one. The time one is uh, on the phi one H of L, and it intersects them. So you send X to the X of one. Just the solution. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. Just the solution to the so x dot equals x dot at t is equal to x h at x at t. Ah, uh, right, right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> right, thanks. Yes, uh, it, it's really a solution of the the, the proof. Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's just a solution, but it has to be a solution. I mean, I mean, keep in mind these are parameterized paths again. It's maps from the interval zero one. Okay, and then Lagrangian terminology of so then you could define Lagrangian floor uh, homology. Of H and its relative L, obviously relative to the choice of the Lagrangian. And the, the story is the same as before. Um, so CFK of H, I should put the L, I'll put the L here and then I'll drop it. You probably forget. Is just uh, the Z2 span of the critical points. Critical points of this action function. So we just count this uh, chords. Uh, and then there is a boundary map that goes from CFK to CFK minus one. Uh, and the story is exactly the same as before. So boundary of X is some. Uh, the number of gradient trajectories from X to Y. There's an index again here too, index of Y equals index X minus one. So here I, if I'm putting K, I should put that there's an index here. X equals K. Something again like the columns of uh, And so you count, so, is it? So I'll just say M of X Y. Well, actually, I've got this. One. M of X Y solutions to the the, the gradient uh, flow gradient flow to death. Call the Maslow index, but it's very similar to. Yeah, it's, it, it is different than the Conley Zener index, but you should keep in mind it's not the dimension of the ascending or descending submanifold because those are infinite. Like it's something that's very specific to the theory. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, uh, and then uh, m hat is again as before equals to m divided by r and m of x y is equal to, uh, so what do I want to say? I think I just want to say minus negative uh, gradient trajectories of AH. But now as I've seen here, uh, and what do these actually look like? So it's 
So this is a path. So this is a map from the real line into this path state. Uh, such that, well, uh, U mod at minus infinity is asymptotic to a given path X and positive infinity is asymptotic to Y. And U dot S equals minus gradient to U. And if you want to draw a picture, now instead of drawing it, a cylinder, you have to draw a half cylinder. So I'll try to do this, but my drawings are terrible. So imagine this is the Lagrangian now. This is L. And um, so this is X. It starts on the Lagrangian and comes back to the Lagrangian. This is X. So this, imagine it's coming out of the door. This is Y. And now you count an object that looks like this. It's half cylinder. This part's on L, this part's, it, it's a set of paths that begin and end on L. It's like a half cylinder that looks like this. Each, for each time, T, for each S, if you fix it, you get a path that begins and ends on it. It's like a half cylinder with the, the halves being on the loop. Uh, and then it solves uh, the same, the same PD as before. It has the same nice properties that so we can count it. So, uh, all I'll say is then P is well defined by the same sort of reasoning as before, and D squared is zero, meaning this is again finite dimensional manifold. When the dimension is zero, it's compact. So P is well defined, D squared is zero because the curves break exactly as a morphology and so on. And so you get, we can define. Floor homology uh, of H relative to L. I guess I forgot to actually put the definition of floor homology in the previous slide, in the previous work, but it's again, it's the kernel of B from CFK. And it's one modded out by its image. Okay, so you get these floor homology groups. I, I, you could guess what the theorem is. So, so we have a well-defined floor homology. It could a priori be zero, but it's not because it gives you, as before, it just recovered the, the homology of the LeBron. So there is again a theorem that says uh, there exists an isomorphism phi, call it big phi, from the singular homology of the Lagrangian L to its floor homology for any choice of. So, and as a corollary, it's part of the actually as well. Any questions? It's again an almost complex stuff. It's the same thing. Yeah. You're counting the same object as before, except previously you were counting cylinders that were solutions. Now you're counting. Uh, half cylinders with a with a boundary condition. Okay, now if you know all this, then I can talk about spectral invariance. So remember, there was I introduced spectral invariance in Morse homology, and now I want to introduce spectral invariance in floor homology. I could have done this for Hamiltonian floor homology or Lagrangian. Uh, what you're going to use is Lagrangian. So take alpha non-zero in the singular homology of the manifold of the Lagrangian submanifold. Then uh, so we want to define some 
the critical value of the action functional associated with this, which can take for the same max problem described previously. So now just keep in mind there is a filtration. I can define well, I can forget about alpha for a second. So I can define the Lagrangian uh, complex up to level P. So this is remember this is the V2 span. Yeah. of x the critical point of action functional but now I assume action of x is less than two. So I just look at those I look at things up to pi t okay sub level set to low t uh, and since we're counting negative gradient trajectory d actually restricts to a well-defined boundary operator on so d actually Restricts to something from the complex back to itself. It doesn't include that action, it increases action. Uh, and, and so then you could again d squared is zero. So what you get is this filter flow of all here. So HF. Uh, T is probably not a good letter because I use it for time, but it's all. This is A. So let's call it A. A here is a number in the real life. So then I look at, then I can define filter cohomology of the pair HL up to up to high K. And this depends on H now and the Hamiltonian flow. If A is minus infinity, this is zero. If A is positive infinity, this is the whole the full cohomology. And so so this the class alpha at some point it appears and that's what I call the spectral. So now I think uh so now I think I'll find the star of L is non-zero and then those T is extremely small. So then, so this is actually less obvious that if T is very small, this thing is zero because the loop space is finite. I mean, there is, it could have, I don't know, I'll take that back. The complex actually find, there's finally many paths. So if P is very, very small, if A is very, very small, the complex is zero. So C the A of HL is equal to C. And so you cannot see alpha. Alpha is not in H of P. And if A is large, then uh, C of A of HL is equal to all of singular homology. And so alpha is in here. So alpha is in the floor homology at level A. So then you define L of large and spectral invariant of alpha relative to H is equal to the pair alpha and H. It's equal to, uh, for example, the Infimal of A such that alpha can be seen in the floor of knowledge. The first height, uh, the first action level at which you go to sing is not from not, not seeing it to sing. I started a bit late. I need uh, any questions actually. We need to put a proper in So this is actually the key definition of the Ruby user. And when I say uh, you see alpha in floor homology, I mean alpha actually is a singular homology. So you might wonder, rightly so. Alpha is a singular homology class, not a floor homology class. So what do I mean? Well, there is this isomorphism phi from singular homology to floor. <laughs> So what it means is that actually I apply phi to it. 
So phi of alpha is, is some object that's well defined in formal. And it's represented by a sum of period by, by a sum of chords, right? Uh, and so what you do is that whenever you see the sum of chords, uh, whenever you see all those chords, that's the step. Yeah. No problem. So what properties does it? Uh, actually, what you have to do, so what happens? Uh, what you do is instead of h star l, you have to take north, and then you take the small north function on l, uh, and then no, then, then you can show that it defines an uh, isomorphism, defines an orthogonal from north homology of that function to the four homology of any. Anyhow, there's, there's this notion of transformation after both homology to play So, yeah, there, there is like a choice of an isomorphism. Right? Once you fix a C2 small Morse function on the Lagrangian, then you can make it proper. So, first property is that obviously L of alpha H. Belongs to what we call the spectrum of H relative to Lagrangian L, and that's just a word for saying the critical values of H. This is property slash definition. It's the critical value of the action. And the second property that I that actually will play uh, an important role is the following there is control on. Oh. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have, suppose you have two Hamiltonians, H and say F. And you want to compare these two. Uh, this is actually going to be important. Then, if you remember, when I did spectral invariance for more homology two days ago, if this was more homology, then you'd get uh, less than equal to maximum of H minus F. And let, I'll finish it on this. Here you could do, you get something different. Uh, and it's this quantity that you get. You get integral from zero to one, and then you look at each time T. So you fix T, you get H T minus F T, and then you restrict it to the Lagrangian. F. So it's sensitive to the values of the Hamiltonian, restrict it to the Lagrangian. So if the Hamiltonians are very far away, uh, <laughs> sort of a large amount, far away from the Lagrangian, it's just like a PT. So in particular, if this quantity is zero along the Lagrangian, then, and on the other side, it's the same thing. Uh, yes, right. This is the yeah. HT minus FT is a function on the symplectic manifold. I restrict it to the Lagrangian and I take the maximal restricted to the Lagrangian. And for each time, yeah, that's why I put L, maximal over L. And this is the, this is actually really uh, a key property. That is going to be used in the proof that this CD is a recovery kilometer. So this is restricted to it. If you examine this inequality for a single Hamiltonian, it tells you the following. This is the last thing we put on the board. Uh, here. So L of alpha comma H. So fix, suppose uh, F is zero, then this quantity is zero. Uh, uh, and this is actually, I think this is actually the specific form of the inequality that we want to use. Then you get it's less than maximum of H for each time P restricted to L, PP, and then greater than equal to the minimum. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we will use this tomorrow. Sorry, I forgot about you. Mm -hmm. Don't have time for questions. I think we there will be one more talk by Sopham tomorrow. So I hope that that, that we, there will be enough time for questions later. And now I think we should meet in uh, five minutes for the last talk, or six minutes, or eleven thirty-five for for the last talk of today. And let us thank Sopham again for this.